Good morning. Nice to see you all. I hope everybody's got a seat. I hope we've all poured ourselves a cup of ambition because we're here to discuss Ambition Nation. My name is Michael Heyman, not Alan Carr, as somebody was saying outside. Uh, I'm here as your, uh, as your MC this morning. Take us through this conversation about the female leaders that are firing up the UK economy. And I think there's a really wonderful story to tell. So I'm hoping we're going to have a very optimistic, fast-moving conversation. My job is to keep it going. So welcome um, on behalf of ThinkCap. Welcome um, also on behalf of EY and Memory uh, Crystal, who are um, hosting this event in association with ThinkCap. And this is part of a nationwide conversation about ambition. So what I want to make sure is I've read um, the CVs of our very impressive speakers this morning. They look like a shy and retiring lot. Not. Uh, but I think we need to get ready for them. Are you with me? Are we ready for a, uh, are we ready for a, bit, of a bit of energy in the room? Yeah. yeah, I think so. I mean, I was, I was just thinking, you know, when I, when I arrived here this morning, it was cloudy and I was reading something that said, The Beast from the East Part 2 is coming. I think in these sequels, they always come so quickly, don't they? They always said, uh, but, uh, but here it is. I mean, but actually in here, we want that kind of blue sky thinking, that sort of red hot heat of optimism. So this morning is all about making sure that we're ready to give those speakers the welcome they deserve. Now, what I would suggest is, has everybody met everybody in the room yet? No. Right. Well, in that case, I'd like to get you started because I think we should do a little bit of speed networking. I've got a whistle just to sort of like give us a sort of a feel. So if you just sort of like get up on your feet, just, just for one moment. Somebody you've not said good morning to. I'm going to give you two goes at this. <laughs> right, off you go. That's... <clears throat> Somebody else, somebody else, a quick good morning. <laughs> right, time please, that's it. Okay, right. Right. <laughs> right, okay, let's have you back to order. There you go. I feel like I'm running Waterloo Station. Can you hear me? Good grief. <laughs> wow, there have been some meaningful friendships found there. Do you take a seat? Right, okay. One last thing for us to do. In fact, two last things for us to do. Right, next thing. Let's just, um, anybody play golf? A few golfers. Uh, uh, an entrepreneur plays golf. A couple of advisors in the back there. Probably very good golfers. A lot of time to spend on the course networking. Right, we all watched a little bit of it. And maybe, yes, sort of turn up at half 12 in the morning. But have we, some, you know, when some of the like, professional golfers, they, they putt in, there's a kind of a certain type of clap. Pretty insipid. Let's try it sort of like that. Okay, very, very good. Right. Okay, so let's agree. This represents the low bar. This represents the lowest level of emotional engagement for this morning. Let's go up. So we're going to go kind of middle of the road. It might be, you know, you feel a polite sort of sense of duty to do it. You might have gone to something, a new musical perhaps. In fact, you know, sort of when Teresa met Jeremy, something like that, you're shocked. It's a sort of, um, it, you know, but you feel the need to be polite. So it might be a middle of the road conversation. Yeah, right. Okay, right. Okay, right. Now, if I was to ask you to give the biggest round of applause that you could give to actually let everybody in this EY building know that we are here this morning on three, two, one. Let's give it some. Right, okay, yes. Hell yeah, right. Now, this, this is my expectation of what the speakers get. <laughs> it's a fair point, it's a fair point. It's a fair point. Right, okay, speakers, you've got to earn it. Right, okay. Now, let's move on. Um, it's a great pleasure to um, be able to sort of welcome you here to this conversation because last year, FinCap launched 
this campaign, Ambition Nation. And if you think about it, right, you can look at the facts that face the UK economy right now, and you can find the facts to suit your mood. And a really sort of big part of this is about how do you feel? How do you feel? What do you believe the future to be? How ambitious do you feel about things? So be quick, quick show of hands. Who is feeling ambitious about the future this morning? Right, and anybody not feeling ambitious? Well, that, no, no, okay, right. So that's a pretty, pretty good starting point. So this is a home of positivity, a home of optimism, because we're going to hear some optimistic stories, I think. So join in that conversation, just to say that um, you can do that um, on Twitter, at FinCap, uh, and the hashtag for this morning is hashtag ambition nation. Um, really be great to get you to share your thoughts. Um, who's not on Twitter? Lady there, lady there, two or three. If you're on Twitter, can I just encourage you now, just take a quick selfie. Let the world know we're here. Ambition Nation on that hashtag. Nick's doing it at the back. Everybody's doing it. Just a quick, uh, quick group selfie, there we go. Just sort of like, um, Ambition Nation. Let's get that conversation going. Let's see if we can get trending in the Canary Wharf group area. So, <clears throat> I can see somebody at the back going, what a dreadful MC. I've never had to do so much. <laughs> Right, OK, let's get going. It's a great pleasure um, to welcome Sam Smith, um, who is the chief executive um, of FinCap. Um, I've worked with Sam over the last year in terms of a number of events that we've run. She's a passionate believer in ambition, a great supporter of women in business. I'd love for you to give not a golf cap, but a full on clap to welcome Sam Smith to the stage to welcome you to Ambition Nation. <laughs> Sam, floor's yours. Morning, and thank you so much for all coming today to our um, Ambition Nation Female Leaders um, event. So 20 years ago, FinCap was started. I didn't really know anything about corporate finance or raising growth capital, let alone setting up a business. But it took us 10 years to grow that division to £3 million turnover. So quite slow growth. We then bought out the division and it took us another 10 years, and it'll be our 10th birthday this year, to get to £25 million turnover. And each stage was almost exactly the same in experience. I didn't have a clue what was going on didn't really know how to do it. Um, I was the only female in my space, so I had to learn from other people. I read a lot of books, um, read a lot of articles, how people do it, but it was a lot of just totally uh, winging it and making it up as you go along and getting more confident as you go through the stage. So I said every, every single stage was about seeing it, experiencing it, get the confidence and then go and deliver it. And I don't know if that feeling is at all familiar to anyone in the audience today, um, but you know, there is no book to be a CEO, unfortunately. Now, what happened about 18 months ago is something in my journey that's been quite instrumental. And it was actually a very short meeting. One of my unofficial mentors had just left the board of a FTSE 100 um, as a CEO of a bank. And I had one lunch with him, and he said to me, look, what's holding you back here? How big could you get? And what I realized is, from the very beginning, I'd had a mental idea of what I should build this company into, how big it could get, and what would be a personal success for me in terms of evaluation. And he said, well, could you actually get it to double that? Could you treble it? Could you be this big? Could you be as big as this? And I said, well, I could, but you know, it was so daunting. I just don't know how, and it would probably take me a long time. So he said, OK, then. Well, if that's possible, stop thinking about this figure because it's holding you back. And I really thought about it, and I had to walk all the way back from the West End to the city because I was so stressed. So what, you know, have I really got to think about this? And by the time I got back to my office, an hour and a half later, I thought he'd totally and utterly right. And from that moment on, I completely forgot about this figure in the back of my head and started to think about how we could get really, really big. And from that day, all our thinking has changed and it's been completely transformational. 
it's made us think about how we can use our brand. You know, we've been um, quite game changers already. I've been the first female CEO of a broker. We've now got to very close to 40% female, which is quite unusual in financial services. So it, we do like to change the game. And we're thinking, well, what could we do with this? Could we be the new culture in finance? Could we take it much bigger? And so now we've started to think about new products, new services, how we grow the business to at least 40 million, but also how we build something to 100 million and beyond. And all of that thinking is going on at the moment. So from one lunch and that one piece of advice, it's been extremely transformational for us. And that is really what Think Big, Be Bigger is about. It's trying to get people to just hear that story of someone who's done it at the next stage that you can just get that little bit more confidence, that little bit more inspiration to think, actually, could I take this 20% bigger? <laughs> could I actually double it? Is it me that's holding myself back? And that's what Ambition Nation, the Female Leader Series, is about, which is all fueling growth in UK small companies. And it's all about trying to make the most potential for female-led businesses. So we're going to do that by getting lots of inspiring stories out there, building a really amazing community, which we'd love for you all to be part of today. And that's a growing community. And also providing some investment expertise and some, some real um, jargon-free background to what is the financial landscape to help people to grow and access the growth capital they need. So I would very much like to thank our sponsors, Ernst & Young and Memory Crystal, um, Leslie and Joanna, who are equally as passionate as I am about women in business and supporting the cause. And we've got some amazing speakers, so thank you all very much for coming today. And I really hope everyone gets something inspiring and just you know, to get you to think that little bit bigger, which does make an enormous difference. So thank you and hope you have a good morning. Okay, now, the um, first rule of any business is disruption. So we have disrupted this morning, and if you're looking at the gatefold, I'm about to tell you that don't look at it because we have completely rethought the agenda this morning because there's so, many, there's so much good content to actually go through that we thought that actually we'd like to give some couple of, a couple of spotlight opportunities as part of the agenda. So if you want to know what's going to happen this morning, we're going to hear um, very shortly from our first speaker, who I'll introduce next. We're going to have two panels, the two panels as you see them in, in the program, looking at scaling up and getting bigger. So we're looking at how we pick up on Sam's introduction. We're then going to finish with a, a, an in-conversation piece with Saha Hashimi, The Entrepreneur's Tale, really something brilliant in terms of the advice of growing businesses and then going on to give advice to those that want to do it again. So let's move on. It's a great pleasure. I, I present a, um, a show called The Capital Conversation and my next speaker was, was a guest a few weeks ago and I have to say an absolutely awesome um, evangelist for not only for business but I think the potential of women as leaders. Um, Dame Helen Morrissey is one of the most influential women in the UK. Um, I would like to tell you that if you're reading City AM you will know that she's hot, uh, hot footing it from this meeting to go and sort Brexit out on behalf of the Prime Minister at, at number 10 um, and um, so we mustn't, mustn't keep her um, but because uh, we all want that sorted out. Um, uh, she's the Head of Personal Investment at Legal and General. Um, she's the former Chief Executive of Newton Investment Management founder of the 30% Club, which many of you will know um, is the, has the goal of achieving a minimum of 30% of women on FTSE 100 boards. Um, but last month she published um, her book, A Good Time to Be a Girl, um, which is not about leaning in, but actually about redesigning the whole system. She says, don't call me superwoman. I say she really is. Please do welcome Helena Morrissey. Well, good morning, um, and thank you, Michael, for that very kind introduction. Nothing to live up to now. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. And I come with an unequivocally optimistic message because I do believe that it is a good time to be a girl. I also believe that increasingly it's an um, excellent time to be a woman. Uh, now, of course, some people say to me, well, how can you say that, given that we have glaring gender pay gaps? We're talking this morning, obviously, about the difficulty women-led businesses might find in raising capital. We've got uh, very few women at the top of businesses and actually not that many in the middle compared with men. And, of course, then there are the more salacious uh, scandals, the uh, President's Club dinner, the Hollywood scandals, Westminster scandals and so forth. How can it be such a good time to be a girl? Now, I think it's very important that we recognize all that, that those um, revelations 
are actually things that have been examples of things that have been going on for many, many years. It's just that what's different now is that we know about them. So the President's Club dinner, for example, was in its 33rd year when we had the one that we now all know about, and it was quickly closed down. So the revelations are it's all out in the open. And generally speaking, although there may be a couple of those in the list that are harder to sort out, then the actions to resolve them are swift. So I think it's very important just to acknowledge the fact that we can't change the past, nor should we ignore it, but we need to focus on our opportunity in the future. And I think this is the deafening noise around the whole gender equality issue is our moment to really seize. Now, I've worked in the city for 30 years. It's still very male-dominated. Um, but those 30 years, um, I have seen a lot of progress over, and they've neatly divided, rather implausibly neatly, into three distinct decades. The first, for me, started in the late 1980s, um, and it was an era when actual hostility, sexual harassment, and discrimination were pretty prevalent in the city. Um, and no one really blinked an eye about it. Uh, for me, I've talked about it quite a few times before, so forgive me if you've heard this before, but it's an important part of why I've done something since around um, trying to help the next generation of women. Because when I returned from my first maternity leave, um, I was 25 years old, I'd taken a few months off, um, not a particularly long maternity leave, and I was eligible at the firm I worked in, the fund management firm I worked in, for the first promotion. So this was no big deal, supposedly. This was the first rung on the ladder when I wouldn't be called a graduate trainee anymore. I'd just be, I suppose, a person. Um, and um, I didn't get the promotion. Uh, and I asked my boss, I mean, he was a man, but by the bio, I was the only woman in a team of 16 fund managers as a bond fund manager. And I asked uh, what I needed to do differently. Where did I need to improve my performance? And the answer came back, oh, your performance is just fine. Just there's some doubt over your commitment with a baby. Now, of course, no one would say that these days, um, but at least I knew where I stood. And I was shocked. I was disappointed. I had never up until that moment thought that my gender would have anything to do with how far I could progress. And I did something about it. I left and joined a more meritocratic firm. But around me, of course, um, certainly for the next decade, although that firm, I had a better experience, and I'll come back to that in a moment, um, we moved on from an environment where, to an environment where people wouldn't say what they said to me. There was a consciousness about upcoming uh, legislation, there was a realization that employers needed to be at least seen to be equal opportunities. But my sense at that time was in general there was a feeling that we were tolerated more than accepted for what new things we might bring to the table. I came across this cartoon recently, uh, I did come across a cartoon, and there it is, uh, which hopefully you can all see, it rather captures it much more eloquently than I could um, with words. Um, but I love the way they've got the list of, they do look like identical men, uh, like the Matrix, really. Um, and then there's a guy who's obviously so bored, he's leaning off and about to fall off his chair at the end there, um, asking uh, what looks to be an ethnic minority woman, describe what you can bring to this company. Now, I posted this on Twitter and someone caught me out. They said, oh, you're making a bit of an assumption, they said. She might be interviewing them. <laughs> which, uh, which was a good catch, um, and I would like to think it was so, but I don't think it probably was. Um, but this was kind of like the environment that we were in then, that you know, there wasn't really a sense that we might add something uh, new. As I said, in my own career, I had a much better experience. Um, Newton, the firm where I joined, was set up by a guy called Stuart Newton, and he um, had built the whole investment process around the idea that you needed different perspectives. You needed to get to the right or closest to the truth in any investment decision. You needed people with different skills, different experiences. And so it wasn't about identity diversity. It was about our experiences. And just to give you a direct parallel uh, to contrast with my first um, experience, I should mention that uh, that disappointment after my first child didn't prevent me having more children. I went on to have nine, so clearly I showed them that. But anyway, um, my ambition uh, got off the charts on that one. Anyway, um, when I announced, and I can say this, yet another pregnancy, one of my male colleagues said very loudly within earshot, deliberately so, oh, I can't believe she's pregnant again. Whereupon Stuart, fair enough in some ways, Stuart, quick as a flash, turned around and said, oh, don't worry, she comes back better each time. <laughs> Which uh, wasn't strictly too, true, um, very generous of him. But just imagine how I felt that I felt that there was absolutely no need to hide what any element of myself, that actually I felt that I was welcome in terms of being the serial mother and having actually a different approach than some of my male colleagues. And I also learned that being more authentic, because in the first company, even though I obviously failed there, 
I had tried to fit in. I had sort of tried to work out, you know, the way to get on was I recognized to sort of get a seat at the table. I needed to be a bit like the other people around the table. Um, but oh, clearly emulating men is probably um, a doomed uh, uh, way of getting on because clearly we're less likely to be good at being men than real men. Um, and why should we? I mean, a lot of this is about being valued for what we might bring to the table. But as I say, in the broader world, it wasn't quite like uh, that. And in fact, I, at the time, um, will just share in passing that I was, uh, my performance was quite good at that moment. And I was in this, I don't want to exaggerate its importance. It was a very small little area of the market, uh, this sort of premier league of bond fund managers um, around a certain type of bonds. And my competition weren't just all men, but they were all called Paul. So um, there were five of them. So, and I'm not making this up. Um, in fact, one of them came to my launch party and came running up saying, was I one of them? And I said, yes, yes, you were. Um, he seemed happy about that. I'm not sure why. But anyway, so there'll be me, Paul, 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 and Paul um, at the investment conferences. Or, you know, and sometimes I won awards. And I never will know if it was just because I was the only person that the judges could more you know, easily identify. But anyway, it showed me the power of being different as well. Um, and then we had this big change. We had the financial crisis. And at suddenly, so this was the heralding of the third decade, that suddenly it was pretty obvious that having one type of person, uh, in that case, not just all men, um, but usually very similarly educated, white, very um, you know, socially entwined, intertwined with each other, uh, very affluent men, a certain age as well, around the table, the board table in particular, couldn't possibly be the optimal team, that mistakes had been made because there was a lack of challenge. And this was a moment to seize. I had been, um, really because having had lots of children, lots of young women were coming up and asking me about you know, their multiple ambitions in life. How do they combine career and a family? And I really wanted to help, um, and I'd set up a women's network in my own firm, but it really wasn't yielding much in the way of results. We had lots of events that said, people said, how inspiring, but it didn't seem to inspire anyone to do anything differently because we still have very few women at the top. But the financial crisis, at least after we'd sort of shored up the global financial system, was a new moment to seize. Um, and that was because there was a realization that we needed new thinking. And I came across this quote um, from Albert Einstein, um, we can't solve problems with the same kind of thinking we use when we created them. Um, and it's such an obvious thing, but it was that moment where there was more of a receptivity <coughs> to the idea that actually we needed more diversity, genuine diversity, um, including in the boardroom. Um, and obviously having a few more women in the boardroom isn't the answer to everything, but it's a good place to start. Um, and in my mind, and this is where we get to sort of like the real nub of what I think we can do in a broader scale now, um, although I'll, I'll expand on that in a moment, what we were looking at was actually changing the dynamic of the boardroom. We were changing the way it worked, changing uh, the way that the discussions and the decisions were made. And not just substituting a few women in place of the, the men, but actually, and I've adapted this from Simone de Beauvoir, because she talked about destroying that notion of power. And I don't like the word destroying, it's a bit aggressive for me. Uh, I think a more feminine word is evolving that notion of power. And I had seen in my own career, because by then I had... Uh, been a CEO of Newton for some time, and I would have been effectively chosen to be the CEO after we had been acquired. And although my colleagues never articulated exactly like this, I believe that they asked me to do it because I had a more collaborative approach to, to leadership than many of my male colleagues. Of course, men can be empathetic and collaborative and build consensuses too, but the macho kind of style of power of telling people what to do, of forcing people, certainly wasn't what was going to work for Newton at that moment in its history, and I think doesn't work more generally in the world today. So the 30% Club got started um, and actually worked, and that was my going, this is a sort of very quick version of events. Um, and one of the things I think sometimes we can feel, we do a lot of talking about this issue now, is anything really going to change? And I, you know, on, on International Women's Day, I think the World Economic Forum put out a forecast saying it was going to take 200 and something years until we had sort of gender parity you can't extrapolate the past in these situations. We have all seen disruption and change happen really quickly when you get in the right moment. And the 30% Club was a bit like that. So we launched at that moment in the kink and the line there. And it wasn't just us. Obviously, we were working in partnership with lots of other groups. But we were very focused. And importantly, we involved men. 
So, uh, for example, EY, very instrumental. Joanna's here has been an absolute fantastic um, member of the steering committee and has done so much around the mentoring scheme and so forth that we do. So Steve Varley, uh, the managing partner, um, and his predecessor, actually, have been very engaged on it. And this has all been about collaboration with men. The men were the ones who had the authority, the power, the present to change things. So when we launched, 99 out of the 100 FTSE chairmen were men. Um, so it wasn't like an optional extra to have their involvement, but actually they needed to lead this. They needed to drive the change because these were their boardrooms we were talking about. Um, and as I mentioned, we were also very collaborative. I mean, it didn't go in a straight line despite what looks um, like a success story here because there was a lot of hostility, in fact, at first. And again, this moment that we're at now where there's a lot of sort of one minute feels like we're making progress, the next minute feels like we've got to lurch backwards. That, to me, is a sign of great change. It's almost in, in, imperative that you have these kind of stop-start moments. When I started doing this, there were just seven um, enlightened chairmen who had initially signed up and were very enthusiastic. I started writing to the um, uh, FTSE 350 chairs, um, starting methodically in this case with A for Al and the alphabet down, got down to HA for Hansen, and I was getting basically hate mail back from the A's and B's I downed tools at that point. They were saying I was interfering with the board. This was a women's issue, not a business issue. I mean, this now feels such a natural part of what everybody does, but at the time it was hard going. And what I did instead was I changed tack, obviously. I'm not completely masochistic. I um, involved the, the, the few enlightened chairs more. They created peer pressure. They created a sense of this is something that we're part of. This is how to modernize ourselves. This is how to move into the next century. So it is just the tip of the iceberg, the boardroom, and I want to just move on and use my last couple of minutes to talk about why I believe we've got a much bigger scale opportunity now. Because if I'm honest, I think that a lot of the diversity initiatives, including ones I've led myself, have tended to be focused on just sort of training a few women a bit better into how to fit into the male structures. And they're structures that wouldn't suit, don't suit many men now as well, or not all men. Um, they're, they're designed for sort of a certain way of, pra of working. Long before we had technology, long before there was a realization that you do need different types of people to make the right decision, have cognitive diversity, and long before um, we had any sort of sense of uh, values being really important in terms of how companies um, behave. Now, I think at the moment we have so many factors at work that even if there was just one of them going on, it would create a different opportunity for the gender equality movement. But the reality is we have loads of them going on at once. And I want to encourage you to see this as, the, to raise the ambitions about what we're trying to do on gender equality. This is not about a few more women at the top. This is not just about having a few more women able to fund their business. This is about wholesale change, about how we, men and women, live our lives and how we work more as partners rather than have the patriarchy that had been um, you know, in societies around the world for many centuries. So just a couple of instances. So the digital age. So we know that, I mean, even a company which is a large company, is not a sort of small entrepreneurial company, legal in general, um, is completely revolutionizing how people work around working from home, smart working, efficient working. This is all about making people more productive or encouraging them to spend less time on their commute, work out. We obviously have to do it thoughtfully. We have to work out how we communicate well with each other. The other day, um, around all the festivities around women, International Women's Month, as it now feels, which is, I think, a sign of progress, um, I was down at Cisco, and they were beaming in through their telepresence um, all these different locations. Um, we had Istanbul talking, asking me questions, and Manchester asking me questions, and Zurich asking me questions, and it was fabulous. They confessed or mentioned, it was not a confession, but um, that uh, their more senior employees have telepresence in their homes. It's a slightly scary thought if you live a life for lots of children and a bit chaotic most of the time, but they couldn't come up with an, um, an example where they couldn't, when it needs to happen, uh, relate to each other uh, from their homes. And um, at the moment, I think a lot of companies are just scratching the surface on this. And also, I think d technology is changing the nature of power. I mentioned um, from power to, from influence, from force to influence. But I think now what we're seeing in so many aspects um, of the big um, uh, political issues is that, and the company issues, is uh, you know, open transparency about every single thing. Everything is discoverable and it changes the nature of leadership. We can all influence, whether we're using Twitter or other forms of social media. Anyone with a network and something interesting to say can get their point out there. And leaders cannot tell us 
anybody what to do anymore. I was travelling back from Denver um, on the night of um, June 23rd, 2016, having cast my postal vote. And um, as we landed, we were all checking our phones. An American lady tapped me on the shoulder and she said, oh, it was Romaine, right? And I said, no, actually, leave one. And she looked at me quite puzzled. And she said, very sort of shocked. She said, um, but we sent the president. Um, and I wanted to say, well, actually, probably that didn't help, you know, maybe, because people won't be told what to do by, by leaders that they don't feel either connect with them or they particularly trust. Young people. So this is another big sort of uh, movement for change. So 30% Club did a big study across 21 universities. In 2016, uh, 20, over 20,000 students took part. And both the men and the fem women that um, answered, over 90% of them said that their top priority in terms of their career choice was work-life balance. That was a term that had not been coined when I was at university. I think if you'd asked the same question, everyone would have just said, make money, get to the top of my career. Much bigger ambitions. And again, this is requiring the young men, I mean, the women's, um, the gender equality uh, work that um, we have within Legal and General and also uh, the diversity project that is now trying to improve diversity across all its dimensions in the investment um, industry. Uh, the gender equality work is co-led by a man and a woman. And the man is a 26-year-old who approached me, his um, very traditional looking talent in every respect, and said, look, I'm thinking about where my career goes in the next 10, 20 years. Um, I don't want the lives that the people around me have who are that age, but I'm really enthusiastic about what I want, want to do. And then, um, importantly, diversity now means diversity of thought. So there's a, certainly in the fund management community, and you may not be seeing it yet in terms of the ability to raise money, but there's a realization that the best outcomes the best uh, companies are going to involve a mix of, of talent and that actually um, if we want to attract and retain the best and brightest young anybody, we need to have very inclusive cultures and environments. Now these are huge changes. Um, it gives us a huge moment. Um, I'm not saying it will all happen overnight. Uh, I believe careers are all labyrinths, not ladders, and I'm sure the same will be true about this. But I believe that this is our moment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right, we've got time for just a oh, couple of very quick. I didn't get onto that one. Oh, hold on, you want to? I didn't get onto that one. No, You're it's right. okay. okay. That's okay. Well, this is our moment, this right? Is our moment. So it seems a good note to end on, doesn't our, it? <laughs> right, it does. But to take the most of a moment, you've got to have a certain type of mindset. If you are mm -hmm. advising people about how they make the most of it, how they seize the opportunity, what's the advice? A lot of people here, growing businesses, people that mm. are in the business of entrepreneurship. What's the best advice you can give to them to take make the most of that change? So you're already doing it if you're growing a business and you've got an idea that you are um, putting out there. Sam said in her introduction, there's no book for being the CEO and there's no blueprint for getting what we're trying to do um, here, real equality. We need to, as they continue to think bigger and bolder, I think we have to be nuanced mm. about how we do it. So don't think, oh, it's just a woman, we'll give her the job. But actually, I think um, I would just uh, encourage people to be as big about ambitions on this as they are about their own business. Right, last question. Mm -hmm. So I was there at your book launch. Um, thank you for coming, Michael. But thank you, it's great. <laughs> Available in all good bookstores, just, uh, just on behalf of Helena. Um, it's, it's fizzing with energy, that book. But a lot of things that happen to authors are they learn something new about themselves mm. when they put a book like that together. What did you learn about yourself in the, in the process of putting Good Time to Be a Girl and authoring it? Well, I first of all learned it's quite tricky to write a book, which uh, I suppose yeah. um, I, I sort of suspected it would be um, just in terms of uh, you know, distilling all your thoughts, but also making sure that it is sort of readable rather than just a kind of thesis. Um, but I think that the biggest thing, because obviously as I was writing it, things were happening all the time. Um, and, you know, I had submitted a draft uh, last July. And of course, I think the day after the BBC released its, you know, top pay presenters, you know, huge gaps. And that mm. seems to most of us outside the... BBC to be unequal pay, so that was a whole another thing, and then we had Harvey Weinstein, then we had, now actually just made me realise just how, um, I use the word before, tip of the iceberg, a lot of the work that we've been doing is, and how now, and, that, and I probably do need to update the book by the end of the year anyway, because so much, I just want to make sure that all the um, topics are, are completely kind of referencing what's happening now. But it made me even more confident that actually this is the zeitgeist um, and that as I learned more about some of the things that others have done around the world as well, um, it just felt that this is all coalescing to the moment where we do shake up the system. Super. The optimistic Helena Morrissey, thank, thank you very you. much indeed. Thank Super. You.